Hi there, I'm Todd Houlihan from Olympus and today I'm joined by Jim Royal, Vice President of Exploration for Pan Global Resources. Hi Jim, how are you doing? Hi Todd, how are you? Very well. Good here, busy, but uh, yeah. good. Yeah, I know you're flat out at the moment, so I really appreciate you doing this for us. It's uh, hugely generous of your time. So um, you've been you've been using Portable XRO for a long time now, um, and so I know you're, you're really experienced, but you've been using it in a very interesting way on this project in Spain. Yeah. So um, thanks for putting this presentation together, and uh, maybe uh, hand over to you unless you have any introductory. No, no. Let's uh, let, let's get stuck in. So yeah. Um... I just, I just put in a, uh, a disclaimer here so that uh, this is the idea of this presentation is not for investor purposes. And, uh, you know, we, if, you, if you are looking to, to invest in the company, just go onto the website or talk to uh, any of the directors. We're happy to, happy to field any comments and, and give uh, specific presentations. Um, so, yeah, so this is me, Todd. Um, I think I've known you from pretty much all of my career. Um, and I've used, Van, I've used uh, Olympus Portable XRF technology for, you know, re really since uh, it, it became popular. Um, started working with it with, uh, with iron ore at Rio Tinto. I've worked in, on uranium in, in, in Berkeley. I've worked in, used it in Chile. I've used it in Portugal. I've used it in Chad. I've used it in Georgia. And, and now we're currently using it in, um, in, uh, in, on, on the Spanish projects as well. Um, here's just a, a few photographs of some of the uses. Um, so this is this is Georgia, and this particular sample there, this is a, a, a meter, I think, at 44% copper. And the one next to it is uh, that came in. Although it looks like grease all over the, the drill core, that's actually chalcosite replacing fine and, and fixing onto fine pyrite. That's uh, that gave a couple of hundred meters, I think, at over a percent copper. We took one when I went with Chac uh, Tecton Minerals to uh, to Chad. Um, that was probably the remotest place I've ever been to. We were sort of out on the on, on in eastern Chad, right up on the border with the Sudan. Uh, Fifty degree heat, uh, no infrastructure, you know, no support from anybody. And you know, we had we had the Vanta or, or we had Delta there um, operating that, that every day with us, and, and that that was amazing. Uh, I've used it in Chile in the third and the fourth region uh, where we used it not only on outcropping outcropping volcanics and, and, and basement, but we also used it in, in areas where there's a, a veneer of sands. And uh, and also when I was in, in, in Spain on working on uranium, uh, what you're seeing there is this is up near Fiudad Rodrigo. I don't, I don't have any information to share with that, but this is up at Fiudad Rodrigo where uh, uh, Wellington, was fighting the French back in the, the 19th century. And all of that area is covered with, with, with uranium shows. And the great thing that we had with, um, with, with, with Avanta is we don't have any conversions between sort of E-grade and, uh, and then trying to get that back to, uh, or, or get, you know, gamma radiation back into E-grade. You know, you can just go for straight into chemistry. And, you know, we had amazing results with that. So this is one of one, one, one of the forts that was blown up by the, the Royal Engineers on their retreat to uh, Lisbon in 1810. And you're saying there's a load of musket balls and things like that lying around? Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, spent many an afternoon wandering the old battlefields and, and reading the memoirs of the, the soldiers and, and, and the exploits that they got up to. And then, you know, with a metal detector finding their bits and bobs, you know, loved it. Really, really, you know, really loved, really loved the area. Great. Yeah, I, w I also worked with um, the Chad, the, the Tecton guys uh, on the Chad project and um, they subsequently bought a banter and then they moved that down to, to Ghana for the Iron Ridge Lithium yeah. project. That, that's a, it's a really good story for Tecton really, isn't it? Ghana, I think man, it's, it's perfect. It was, uh, you know, Alan, Alan was the... Uh, was the mover there um yeah re really good really good project you know it's uh, a ple pleasure to have worked on and contributed on that one yeah mm. all right let's keep going so okay. i'm currently uh vice president of 
about exploration for Pan Global. Um, very, very strong board. Um, I, I worked directly with Tim Moody, who's ex Rio, and uh, it, just just a brilliant guy to work with. But then we're also backed up with Patrick and Brian and uh, and Bob as well, and and also you know, the late Bob Baxter. A lot of the people in South America will uh, will remember Bob. He, he he passed away at the beginning of the year. But I think that this graph is this goes back a couple of years, and this is the, the, the stock price. And this is I think this is the reason why people get into junior junior stocks, where uh, that this is the um, the first hole that we hit on La Romana you know, on the Romana project back in the middle of uh, 2019, and this is where we are now. So we've we've gone from trading 10 to 12 cents, which would be fairly normal. To seventy cents, so and uh, and and it's and it's looking really good at the moment. With some pretty well known um, investors uh, yeah. coming in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, uh, we do, we do, we do, we're doing well on that side at the moment. But it's it's, it's all about it's all about the results, I think. And how many holes have you drilled now? Well, we've got um, I think somewhere around fifty on the on the Raman. I think I think was somewhere around fifty that that, that have been amount been, been announced. And we we you know we've I've got two rigs going at the moment, um, big exploration program, and so we we as the results come in and we interpret them, we put them out out in batches. But uh, at, at the moment, I've got two rigs going twenty four hours a day, so it's uh, it's busy busy. And you're based in Spain. You've lived in Spain for some time now, right? That's right. I, I came first came here with Rio Tinto. I was um, on the discovery of Las Cruces down in Seville. Um, so I've been I've been here a while. So we've got two projects. Um, we've got the Agulhas project, which was uh, an IOCG project up in up in Cordoba. Um, that that that's got, that's gone well. We, we put about thirty holes into there, and we're currently doing sort of a regional based soil sampling and using using the Vanta. And the, the reason why we're 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 in the limelight at the moment is the Escathena project, which is down in, in, in the in the Iberian Pirate Belt. Um, and we've been we've been going hard at that for the last couple of years. F for those who don't know what the Pirate Belt is about, it's for for me it's one of the most uh, prolific metallogenic belts in the world. Uh, it's it's the land of giants. There are deposits here that are in excess of 500 million tons. Um, we, the Roman Empire was built on the back of it. The Industrial Revolution in the, in the 19th century as well was on the back of it as well. It's, it really is an empire builder. Um, huge deposits. What you're seeing in the, in the, in the maps, so this is the Rio Tinto open pit that's currently being operated by Atalaya, who listed in London. I've, uh, they've done an, they're doing an incredible job. Uh, in the middle, this is the uh, the plant for the Matza deposit, and they've got three three operating mines. All, all three of them are underground, and one of them is a, 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 a reasonably recent discovery, Magdalena, and it just shows in an air, in a belt that is pretty um, it's pretty brownfields. They're still we're still turning up economic deposits, <clears throat> and the one, one of the one of the most incredible deposits is Las Cruces. That's a, that's operated by First Quantum. Um, they've just finished just finished the uh, the super gene, the open pit, and they've been given the uh, the all clear to uh, start looking at the under the um, the the underground underground development of that deposit. But that's that's an amazing thing. This it was never discovered by the Romans because uh, it had miles on the top of it. And the super gene, I think, it's about 15 million tons at six percent copper. But again, just 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 phenomenal grades all the way through it. Yeah. And you're involved during the discovery of that. That's right. I was right back at the beginning in my clear career when I was with Rio Tinto. Mm. Nice, nice. Mm. Let's keep going. Yeah. So uh, we started pretty humbly on this project. We started with one hole and then second hole and then a couple more. We were working out a little garage, the three of us working out of a little garage in the nearby village. And uh, pretty early on, it was clear that what you're seeing on the, on the left-hand side, we're getting these sticks of massive, massive chalka pyrite coming out the ground. And the, and the project sort of grown and grown and grown in, in, incrementally as we, uh, as we found more. And so this, this is a, a photo currently of what the core shed looks like. We're having to build another core shed next door. 
having to build more technical offices. We've gone from three people to close to 20. So, you know, it's, it's going well. Uh, got a couple of rigs so over here, got a couple of, couple of rigs operating. Um, it's, it's the private farms. So, um, you, you know, it's, it, it, it can get complicated to work here, but uh, we, we're going okay. And the, the Vanta has been an integral part of our, our program since really since we started. It's, uh, it's, it, they're, they're great little units. I wouldn't, wouldn't be without one. Um, so a bit more about the project. I'm, I'm giving a plug to the, to, to the company here, but I think it's, I think it's worth it. The, the Pyrite Belt is a metal attack that really goes from sort of Seville up to Lisbon. And all through it, there are a number of historic mines and operating mines. Um, you've got Nevis Corvo in Portugal that's operated by Lundin. As I mentioned before, we've got um, uh, Matza. We've got uh, First Quantum here. Uh, there's a couple of explorers here as well, which, which, which is great. And our actual project, we, we, oh, we've also got Smelter and, and a couple of ports. So there's infrastructure, there's people, there's... there's uh, if you find something here, it's a good jurisdiction, so you can always get the thing going. Um, yeah, re really, re really fascinating place to work. And then the slide here is just showing our project. So this is where we're drilling. Uh, so we're sort of down on the southeastern part of the uh, of, of the pyrite belt. Um, and in this slide, I've got Cobra Las Cruces, I've got Adna Coya, and I've got uh, Rio Tinto. And just in that, there's probably about 500 million tons of ore, you know, and uh, as reserves at the moment. So it's a uh, it, it's a massive it's a massive producer of metal. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, and, so this is you said in, you said on that previous slide that the sort of classic VMS country. Yeah, the, that's right. Edge, edge of that ridge is that? Mm. That's right. So this is the. Um, the pirate belt, and this, is, this would be classic VMS terrain or classic pirate belt terrain where the, uh, the, 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 VM, the Paleozoic rocks are outcropping. And then you can see where there's this break in the, uh, in the land use. And this is where you've got the tertiary cover. So I think, I think the future for the pirate belt will be in areas where um, they're either going to be, deposits are going to be concealed under, you know, under, under thrust slices from older rocks or concealed under tertiary under under tertiary cover where there's just no show for them um, in you know in, in, on surface and that and that's the case with La Romana it was never it was never found by the Romans and that's uh, and that, that's great news for us. Okay, so this is the deposit itself. This is a, or a, a plan of the uh, the area. Um, originally, it was a gravity a gravity anomaly, and uh, Exxon. Back in the day, they drilled ten holes, and they intersected some mineralization, but they didn't. They didn't follow up on that, and then the area was. Uh, no one really operated the area up until we came along. Uh, we we acquired the project privately, and since then we sort of started drilling in the peak of the gravity anomaly, and then we've been working out and out and out. And currently, it's uh, we're doing incremental step outs. We're not, uh, we, you know, we don't want to step too far because geological continuity is so important. Um, but it's open at the moment um, in both directions and in down dip um, to the, I've got some cross sections later. You'll see it sort of, it, it, it daylights to the, it daylights to the south. So we've got that one pretty much controlled, but it's open in three directions at the moment. And the types of intersections and, uh, that we're getting would be, you know, yeah, any, know anywhere so. between sort of 10, 10 and 40 meters of mineralization. Uh, it's a, it's a stack system. Um, and the grades, the grades are anywhere between sort of half a percent and, and sort of one and a half percent. You know, some some stuff we get exceptional intersections, but uh, you, you know that would be more or less the range. And one of the interesting things about is we're going to we, we're getting tin in, in the deposit, and that's quite rare in the pirate belt. The only one that we really know that's significant with, is uh, Nevish Corvine. So to have to have cassiterite along with the Chalka pyrite ore, it, uh, it, it adds a lot of value to us. Right. Um, so this is this is a, I'm just I'll, I'll move fairly quickly through these. These would be sort of cross sections through the de, through the deposit, and you know we, we've spent quite a lot of time trying to get the geological continuity. 
And so we end up with a, a sort of a stack system the, uh, with, with the principal unit, probably about, you know, as I say, 20 to 40 metres wide, uh, and, it, and it dipping at about 40 degrees to the north. Uh, it's covered. It's got, a, it's got a cap of, you know, anywhere between one metre and 20 metres of, uh, of, of miles. And, yeah, that's the thing that really sort of protected it from the, from, from, from the Romans. And you can see down there that that's sort of the grades that we're looking at. Is another one as well, another, another couple of sections. So it's fairly straightforward. In some of the sections, we get um, chalcosite enrichment, very similar to Las Cruces, up near the up near the tertiary into up, up near the tertiary interface, and that's something we're looking at quite hard at the moment. And what, 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 as opposed to chalcopyrite beneath that, as, as opposed to chalcopyrite. So as these VMS systems were being weathered. You know, since deposition, mostly mostly in the Miocene, they were getting they were getting upriched um, or enriched to to chalcosite. So the, the chalcopyrite converts to, uh, to, to to chalcosite and to oxides. And if you're lucky to have that preserved, you know that, that can be a really sweet part. Uh, it can produce a really sweet part of the the deposit. Right. Oh, wow. So I um, here we go. This is this is why I use the portable XRF, and why I would recommend it to anybody is um, it's the difference between do or not do uh, in some cases. So we're, if we're in very remote areas or there's limitations on budget, if uh, if you're innovative, you can find ways to use the to use the uh, the portable XRF and be able to produce baseline data so it's 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 great for that um we can obviously save time and money you know we don't have to rely on a on a labor on a laboratory and we're getting real time results as well so that's you know that that's one of the huge uh, value adds and i think as well we're not looking to substitute the laboratories but these things can add a completely different new layer of information uh, to, for the for the geologist it's a bit like having a uh, a microscope on site or a, a core tester or, or, or whatever it be it's it, we're not saying it's it's a substitute here we're saying it's, it's a new layer of information and, that, and that's that these will be where, where the where the value is on these things I'd, yeah. i do like that um that phrase the new layer of information that's and you've got a really good example coming up i know but that's a really nice phrase actually yeah yeah that's yeah. right so um i mean there's a lot of people there's a lot of debate on or you can't use the results for uh, to, to, to put out to the market, but, but really it's the purpose of you, you've got to know the limitations and you've got to know how you want to apply the data. So it is, it's just another layer of information and it's, and it's, and it's up to you how you, how you use that data. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, how do we use it? We, our, our Vanta probably starts work at, Seven o'clock in the morning, and it's one of the last one of the last people to lo lo leave the workshop. Uh, we you know, we've got a full time operator. Uh, we're doing anywhere between 100 and 200 readings a day, and we're using those on a, on, a, on a whole suite of uh, on a whole suite of samples. If it's soil samples at the moment, I've got a program that's doing about 400 samples a month. <clears throat> we're using it as a as, a, as a, an aid to core logging, where uh, it's helping with identification of lithologies. Um, minerals, you know, the black mineral, the grey mineral. It's helping out on the identification on the identification of those. Um, it's helping us with alteration. And I've got a slide a bit later on showing how uh, I, I, I think that this is uh, pioneering work. We also use it for as an assistant with sampling, so it helps us um, select the interval that we want to send down to the laboratory. It gives us a heads up if we're working with the pulps. It'll give us a head up on on what the grade prediction is on the on the, on the material that on the samples that have gone off, and also as well. And we're very fortunate. We've got ALS there in Seville, and the prep the prep lab will have the samples probably in, in in three or four days, and so we can get the pulps back. We can analyze the pulps, and that's probably two to three weeks before we get the, the the chemical analysis so it really does help at all levels you know at tim's level who's thinking about press releases at my level who's we're thinking about uh, strategic planning at the geologist level whether it's helping them as a, as, as a logging tool 
it really is um, a huge advantage for us. Yeah. But and, I just, um, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you, you, you are really lucky to have that sample prep facility and be able to get the pulse back so quickly, well, you know, well in advance of the lab data. That, that's right. That's right. Um, uh, uh, best case scenario, that is, really, for you. It, it, it really is. And it, uh, I think as well, if, uh, if I was working in a remote area, I, I, th I think there would be a, a, a strong case to say, well, let's install a, a, a containerized lab, you know, because... Or do some sort of sample prep, yeah. Exactly, exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so important, you know, we, 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 we're, we're three weeks ahead of the game. And it's worth pointing out here that due to the regulations in Spain that, that place quite a uh, substantial... It makes it quite onerous to use it as a handheld. You're using it in the workstation full time. Yeah, that's right. We uh, uh, we, we have to use it in the workstation. There is yep. um, when I worked with with other companies, I, I've got my I've got my own operating license, but uh, the, the workstations are brilliant. There, there's there's no need to be to have the have the Vanta shooting on the core, and you know, it, it and anything that you need will fit inside the workstation. So it's they're really good. Uh, I, I think one of the, the the only other point on this slide would be it's so important to have good QAQC, um, and, and, I, and I've got some examples here coming up. So, a bit of a plug to Aureus. Anybody that's running a portable XRF, if they don't have a a portable XRF kit where you can select it for your style of mineralization, or you can handpick your pucks for based on what you think your mineralization is. Um, they're, they're they're an essential part. They're, they're they're brilliant. They're really really good. We use those again probably every ten samples. We run a we, we run a, a a sample from from one of these little kits. And what I'm showing here is just this is some early work that I did where I'm comparing the XRF grade to the to the actual CRM. And this is the type of the type of graph that you should expect where correlation correlation coefficients are probably close to one. And you may see slight differences, you know, 10, 15 percent between what the CRM, the, the certified value is, and what your PR XRF data is. But it, the graph should look like that. If they're not looking like that, there's there's, a, there's an issue. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's and it's important to be to, to, to be very stringent with this with with uh, with with, with, uh, X, with uh, QAQC data. Yeah. Uh, one of the big one of the big recommendations is matrix match standards. Absolutely. Or, or, you know, even if you've got materials from your own deposit and you oh. use those as your CRMs or, or internal standards, that's fine as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and the guys down at Aureus are so good. I mean, they're, 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 they're just, it's just a great company and so helpful on, on, on all aspects of, of, of having these stands prepared or, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't go anywhere else. Okay, so let's keep going. I'll show you some of these applications now. Um, so this is a, uh, a real soil survey that we did where we took a number of lines of soils and then we had them prepared at a laboratory uh, and we, we first analysed the, just the sample in the bag and then we looked at the, the fine fraction that went off for chemical analysis. We vanted that as well and we also... Uh, and then compared that back to the lab results. Um, again, a, a, a really quite amazing. This is looking at line data, where we're, we're looking at well, copper, copper and lead along the lines, and a very close fit on on on, on pretty much all of the elements. So it's we, we go from again taking the sample, having it prepped, having it analysed, getting the samples back to uh, really just within 24 hours, just hit the bag um, and, and having practically the same results. Because here, here not, with soils, you're not so not so concerned about absolutes, you, you, you're concerned about relative differences in the anomalies. So, you know, this is this is just simple. And uh, orange is the fine fraction in this case, is that right? And the That's right. So the so the so the orange is the is, is the fines and the yeah. blue would be just hitting it through the bag. And then the green is uh, the the lab result there. 
Well, right. around 150 ppm copper in this case. And that's zero. right. That's right. Yeah. On, on the lead down here, slightly higher. We're going from you know, zero to the range here is zero to 300. This is zero yeah. to one, 160. Um, and, and, and the so same here. This is zero to 250. So pretty pretty low level stuff. And so after doing this orientation work, did you decide to do no sample prep and just test the, the samples yeah. after sieving? You sieved to one mil. We sit down to less than one mil. Um, the reality is, is when you do the, the samples, is that you, you don't see a lot of difference. You'll get more of a homogenous sample if you, when you're doing your repeats, but the it, you, you're not getting a, an, an enrichment, so so to speak. Um, the one to watch here would be uh, moisture. You know, moisture does affect the, the, the data quite a lot. Um, we don't microwave, we don't oven, we just put a fan, open the bags and just have a fan over the top of them to just air dry for 24 hours. And then, um, so you just, that moving forward, after doing this orientation survey, moving forward, you decided you're happy with the data on yeah. directly through the bags on sieved less than one mil stuff yeah. on bait for, for, the, for the transition metal, base metal. That's right, that's right. Yeah, okay. And, and um, Again, this so this would be a graph. This is the same data presented as uh, as bivariate plots, and again, you've got that, that 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 very similar trend where you know correlations are fantastic in a lot of the elements, and you've got to be aware of which elements they are. But you'll generally see a slight uh, slight decrease between the portable XRF and the and, and the lab result, and that's not that, that that's a that's a, a multifaceted issue, I guess. You know, you've got, the, you've got uh, attenuation from the bag, you've got the limitations of the machine itself, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, but, but in general, Maybe very clear. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But in, gen but in general, very clean data. Mm. And so this would be a, this is the survey uh, for, I think this is lead. For the where we did the orientation survey, and this is where I pushed the head with the with the, with the portable XRF, and you can okay. see pretty much no no join between the uh, there's there's not there's not been any issues with leveling across the, the two data sets, and again really what we're interested here is the, is the anomaly itself. You know we, we you know we're looking to discriminate the anomaly. I'm not I'm, we're not so not it's not so important to look at absolute values here. What's happening down the bottom left of the, the lab data plot? It looks like, yeah. Down here? No, bottom left to my, yeah, that, that, what, what's happening there? I don't know. That's This is probably just edge effect from the gridding. Right. Um, yeah, I, I don't think it's a technical issue. Here. You often see it where if you have, you know, depending on, 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 on what fit you're using on a grid, you can you can create edge effects. Uh -huh. So it's, it's an important thing to just to just know know how to process the data as well. Okay, so um, let's do a bit more QAQC, but in a in a scenario now uh, where we're looking at drilling. So we're running we're running uh, duplicates and CRMs probably every ten to fifteen samples, depending on the, depending on the, the the need. And the green line. This is a low level standard. This is a twenty four B from Orias, so pretty low level. And the green is the certified value, and the uh, the blue and the orange lines are uh, the, the the results that we're getting. We could spend time fitting to the line, but we you know we don't we don't think it's worth it. Um, but what we do do is we will do an analysis of the puck, and then we will put same material from the bag itself, the sample bag. We put that between it, and then we compare the two data. So we so so we're looking, and I'm really just looking for a straight line. Uh, I'm not looking for too, too much, but too much variation. Uh, you can see at higher levels, well, at, at both levels, really, you see the, the, the effect of the attenuation of the bag, which is often often linear. Um, but the, the, the data is clean. I'm, I'm happy to I'm happy to accept the data that the Vant has given us. Yeah. <clears throat> the, a, a word of uh, a, a word of warning that it's worth using the blank with the bag. Check the blank and then put the bag over the top of it and check that as well because the bag will often provide um, cadmium or zinc or copper. It'll it'll 
whatever the sample meaning is, it won't be it won't mean it will won't be nil. So that's worth worth looking at. Yeah, just understand the effects. Yeah. And and you're doing 30, 30, 30, right? Yeah, 30, 30, 30, 30. 30. Yeah. 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 30, 30, 30. And we, we could do uh you know, we, we sometimes we'll change it. Um the 30, 30, 30, it's you know, it's it's not it's not a really long run time. But it's not a short run time either. So you know, I, I, for us, it's a, it, it, it works 30, 30, 30. Yes. Okay, let's keep going. So um, I put this slide up because I think that with QAQC data, it's not so much trying to um, calibrate the machine to get it to replicate exactly what it should do. You know, you you want to be investing time in in uh, stuff that's upstream from there. In this case, this is lab lab data for um, for quarter core duplicates. Our nominal size is you know we drill at HQ and then we use half core for, for, for sampling. But our quarter core, because we want to keep it, we want we, we don't want to be destroying sections of core. Our, our duplicates we use quarter and quarter. So what we can see here is as you move away from background. Well, not so much with zinc, but well, certainly with with tin and with copper, uh, you, you start seeing. I, I guess it's almost like a nugget effect where with, with the quarter core would be too small. I think, um, and and this the, this is this is where I think you need to be investing the time. You know, so in, investing in a geologist, making sure that they understand what they're looking at, and uh, and understand the sample mediums. Not much more to add there, but now this is where it got, starts getting uh, starts getting good. So what I've got here is um, data from the last ten drill holes of so there's 400 and 1407 samples here, and essentially what I've done is I we analysed the pulp and we we plotted that against the the, the laboratory. So we've got copper, zinc, lead, tin cobalt and silver. Uh, the green line marks a 45 degree line through the through the that's perfect correlation. And again, it's it's this same theme coming through. We were very, very close um, correlations on the metals that we we use. Uh, and just a slight difference, just a slight a slight difference between the lab and and on what the Vant is producing. But it's important to understand the limitations of the, the Vanta itself. Um, what I've done here is I've plotted up where where I would accept copper is a good element to use. Cobalt would not be a good element to use in this particular scenario with um, with the portable XRF, no matter what reading it gave us. But down the bottom, we've got silver plotted up here, and I guess that somewhere between zero and twenty ppm, you've got to put a bit of doubt on whether on on, on the reading itself, but. Greater than 20 ppm, I'm quite quite happy to accept that you, you know it's got silver in it, and it'll be appreciable silver silver as well. So it's so we've got you know accept 100 percent to reject 100 percent to somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I think um, I think I mentioned in my last video that maybe with silver you could try testing a little bit longer on that beam three that's running at 50 kilovolts to see yeah. if. You improve that less than 20, um, but you're right. Cobalt in the presence of high iron and yep. vari variable iron, um, it's just a challenge for, for XRF, let alone portable XRF. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's right. That's right. And I, I think if I was working on cobalt deposits, I'd want to try and work this out. I'd want to try and get my head around it. But uh, Yeah, and we have had some success where, you know, you're in a deposit style that has consistent iron and um, – I know the guys in Australia have done a fair bit of work on that and we've put yeah. out some decent numbers, but um, you definitely should be wary of of the instrument's ability to, yeah. to routinely be able to do cobalt. Yeah. I just, just want to highlight a couple of things here. This this data here is is going between 0 and 14% copper. Um, this is just done for zinc. It's just under a percent. Um, for I mean we, we don't have a lot of lead and zinc in the system. This is 0.3% here, and then this is tin down here. This is uh, between zero and one percent tin. So you can you can see that I, I guess it starts being affected above 0.2. Uh, 
but it's still very, very good for for, for, for Tin. You know, we're, we're really happy with the results on for, for it. Yeah, it's pleasing to see the data on Tin. To be honest, um, that 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 will be the 50 kV theme free, adding a lot of value there. I suspect. Yeah. Um, that's really nice. Really nice. Okay, let's move forward. So um, I think this slide here is just a zoom in where we're looking at this this part in copper. Just having a look at the uh, the lower end. Uh, just so you can see how good the the, 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 the data is. So the, again, this is just just analysis of the pulp. We don't put it in a puck. We don't do anything to it. We just 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 wind that wind the bag up and put it in the in the uh, in the analyzer. And you know, fantastic. And if I went down to point two, it would show exactly the same spread. Probably a difference of about ten percent. Fabulous. Yeah. Copper's always been portable service. One of portable service best elements. Yeah. Um, and so what I've got here is uh, is an actual application of that where the graphs here are showing depth down hole. The top graph is copper versus copper with the Vanta being in orange and the lower graph is tin versus copper. And then on the right hand side, these are scatter graphs of the, the, the same data. So I just wanted to show what a scatter graph would look in, you know, when you're looking at the stuff down hole. And this slight variation that you can see is only really on the peaks of the anomalies. The, the actual anomaly itself in both cases absolutely nails it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's only just, you know, the, the, the peaks, the difference between 0.7 and 0.8. You, you can get that difference just with uh, just just with the sampling. So really, really fantastic data. Uh, and and you, you raised the point uh, yesterday when we were having a preliminary chat about this, that... Um, what you would therefore have your guys investigate in the core once you got this data back was whether the higher grade, you know, um, discrepancy is indicative of any change in mineralisation and that would be the potential for matrix effects to be going on. Yeah, that's that, right. That, that, speak yeah. to that because that's really interesting. Yeah, so, so uh, again... You know, we can look at we we can spend all the time we want looking at the differences between the lab and the Vanta and trying to justify that. Whereas, I tend not to do that. We, you know, we 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 would invest our time where okay, so I've got a really good correlation between the copper and the tin in in in, in what would be the B zone. Um, but what we're seeing is the peak in the tin is slightly offset, or the or the or the peaks in the tin is slightly offset from the peaks in the uh, in, in the copper. And so what I'd have the geologist look at and say, well, why is that happening? And I, I, I'm probably pretty sure that in this case, we're probably getting a lift from chalcosite in, in this particular this particular sample. And, and, and this feeds into the narrative around, you know, the portable XRF is enabling a geologist to, inv to aid his logging. Yeah. Oh. Absolutely, absolutely. I've, yeah. I've got a, uh, it, the, having the Vanta in the core shed will change the whole. It will change the whole feeling. It will change the whole the whole spirit that's happening in the, in the core shed. It will, it will start talking about geological processes as opposed to just logging color changes or logging, you know, percentage of sulfides. You know, this this really gets people thinking about uh, thinking about what they're what they're looking at. It's, it's, it's a great um, observation. Really, yeah. I haven't heard that before. Okay, let's keep going because uh, your, your time is short. So this is, again, this is sort of confirming what we already see. This is looking at a couple of other elements um, from different drill holes. So this is uh, lead and zinc. In this case, we see the Vanta is slight is reporting slightly higher than the, uh, the, than the laboratory itself. That's not normal. So again, we would look have a look at the species, the, 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 see if there's anything in the zinc, anything in the sphalerite that is slightly different between the different holes. Or, you know, you know, this would be a, a classic case where we want to go and have a look at the logs again and just see why we're seeing that difference. You know. Yeah. Right. But the lead, lead absolutely nails it. There's a, a note here that RC, RC people who are drilling with RC. I know there's lots out there, but this is a, a quick test that we did where we were looking at uh, just hitting the bag for the coarse reject and then looking at the pulps with, with the lab result and, and the Vanta. And again, 
if you're using RC, I think that you can use the Vanta, and I think we already know that, but we can use the Vanta to discriminate, uh, you, you know, and be very confident in the in the result that it's giving us. So in this is four different drill holes, uh, in in all, in all of the cases that there's, uh, we're, we're seeing a very close correlation between just rough course reject and and the pulse itself. So a great, I would have no issues with uh, with reducing the amount that I send to the lab. Yeah, yeah. so has sample selection. Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a great, great plot. Okay, now this is the, for me, where I think it's a bit, a bit groundbreaking. Uh, I'll describe what we're seeing in this particular slide. It, this is a, these are two drill holes. The red would be our copper mineralization. And what we're plotting here is sodium and calcium uh, from the lab. And we recognized this early on where we were seeing sodium in some holes and then it would, uh, it would either taper off or it wasn't present in, in other holes. Uh, and it was only when we started re-drilling in this area, we started recognizing this, this is really happening. Um, you can't actually see any differences in the rocks between one rock and another one. I guess as we move towards the mineralization, the geologists will start recognizing uh, chlorite. They'll start recognizing the, the pyrite come in. Obviously, what the, uh, the the main part of the mineralization through the center of this thing, and then and then we start seeing lift in some of the holes. We start seeing a lift with uh, with sodium and calcium again. Uh, we recognize this as alkali depletion. So, and, and this is classic in VMS terrains. It's the it's the first part of the uh, the alteration process. Um, now, when we went back and had a look at the rocks, these these two bits of core are from the same hole. Uh, we analysed them both. One of them's got greater than two percent calcium in it, and the other one has none. the The portable XRF will not give us count. It won't give us sodium, but it will give us calcium. It will give us other elements. And if we understand our data and we understand that calcium is related to sodium in, in, in some way, you can pick elements on the Vanta that will, that will help you out. Um, now, what, what we see here is the rocks are essentially the same, like this slightly slight different change in colour, but the, uh, the geologists won't start logging chlorite, iodide alteration until further down the hole. So, you know, our interpretation of this, and it's, you know, it's still work in progress, is that the Vanta is more sensitive than the Hanman's. And we're actually seeing geological processes really at the really where they begin to start, uh, and it's only further down the holes where these processes become a bit more intense, and we can actually recognise, you know, ch changes in mineralogy and uh, and and, and the, the the introduction of, of other of other uh, of, of other elements really. So uh, it's it's it really this for me is I mean I'd love to see data from uh, from from other deposits and know if there's there's more people doing doing this stuff down in other places yeah yeah the fedex guy just arrived all <laughs> oh, right okay. when you're getting to the good bit so i just yeah. gave him a thumbs up but no this is this is when we talked oh, months ago oh, six months ago we talked about this yeah i'm so glad we're getting it in on paper now because this is i'm sure there's a lot of other people doing this i, I just haven't heard a lot about it from other people so if there yeah. is anyone else out there doing similar similar work we'd love to hear about it because this yeah. is exciting i reckon this is I'm, where it's genuinely adding value and helping yeah. helping you understand your deposit here, here, here the way we've done this uh todd is normally when you you would use it to sort of pick a particular it's got such a small beam that you would use it to pick a particular mineral or whatever what we do is we just present the rock you know and we're not actually looking for any uh any sulfides in this particular we just present the rock sample and then we go down the hole every five meters or something taking and taking a reading and we'll just see that the, the calcium tapering off and then the chloride tapering in is a bit further down so it's fantastic i'm, I'm really pleased with this yeah it's excellent yeah okay so uh let's keep going yeah. now this is uh we, we i wanted to leave these slides in this is uh a few of my hobbies here and i think that the vanta is is uh we underutilize it i think that there's a whole heap of applications for it. i saw one the other day that we were talking about using it on stained glass windows 
Um, I've been using it on coins that, I, that uh, people have, have lent to me. And what you're basically seeing here is a move from Celtic uh, through to Visigoth, Roman, medieval, and then more modern, uh, more modern coins. This one's actually, a, a, it's, not, it's not a coin itself. So there's really probably around 2,000 years of, of uh, coin making in, the, in this particular slide. Um, now, what, what I've done is I, I, I presented the stuff in, in age data there. This is, the, this is the Celtic coin that came from the UK and, and shows why the Romans were, were interested in, 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 uh, in, in, going to the, in, in going to Britain and, uh, and understanding the metallurgy. You know, that 60% silver, 2% copper. They really did understand how to, how, how to clean up their, um, how, how to clean up their coins. This is, again, this is a Celtic one from the UK. Copper, lead, moderate tin. Uh, in this particular case, I bet that this is reflecting the metallurgy of the deposit. As then we move down into, into the Roman period, uh, depending on whether, whether they come from Spain or whether they come from, you, you'll see... You'll see the copper. You'll see some of them are refined and some of them aren't. And then you'll sometimes see this where they're not actually producing copper coins. They're producing bronze coins. And again, that will reflect probably the deposits that are being where these, these will be uh, um, veins within granite where there's the, the copper, the, the chalcopyrite and the, uh, and the cassiterite are appearing together. And they just didn't know how to refine it properly. Uh, Let's keep going here. This one, again, you can see this one, 75% copper and 18% lead. A very different chemistry to the one above it, which is probably from the, you know, a, a, a similar place. But you can see that they've come from two different mines. Um, and then as we move down, you know, through the medieval period, you can see that the, the, the metal or the metal working becomes a lot more refined except for this one, I think, this one, I think, where they, they, they're actually using a thing called Velon, where they were mixing copper and tin, copper and silver together. And depending on how the economy was at that stage, they would put more silver in or more copper in. Um, the, and the, these ones here, that, that was in the early medieval period, but in the later medieval period, what they actually did was just restamp the coins so this one here is a 16 Marvades that's been restamped to 12. Um, you know, as the as the the Spanish uh, the, the Spanish economy waxed and waned. And again, here this is a these are these are great. So you got an, an arrowhead from the the early Copper Age. This is the the, the first attempts at, uh, at at metallurgy where they were using malachite and azurite, just producing a little crucible with a, a copper wire in it. And hammering it flat to produce a, an arrowhead, very clean. A little bit of probably a little bit of arsenic in it, but generally very clean. Then, as the as you get the fibulas Roman, that's from the UK, and they and the Romans knew how to produce bronze. So this is this is not copper. This is this is this, this is bronze. Uh, Visigoths from, from this is a belt buckle or part of the belt buckle, and again, you know they were they. They, they probably weren't as good at cleaning the Rome, cleaning the ores as, as, as the Romans, and they're leaving the lead in it, they're leaving the zinc in it, they're two percent arsenic, and so and that could probably be toxic. I <laughs> won't that one anyway. Yeah. And then and then this one is a classic. This is a this is a brown best musket ball fired at the French in probably eighteen ten or eighteen twelve, um, where if you look at the chemical composition, it's got fifty percent lead um, and thirty percent sulphur. And a little bit of tin, so this this has probably been mined from Cornwall. And instead of purifying, I need to do more work on this, but they, they, in, in, it seems to me that they weren't purifying the uh, the lead or the galena. They were just just maybe melting it and then pouring it into pouring it off these shot towers to, to produce musket balls and probably selling it to the British government as, uh, as 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 the best lead bullets in the in the empire. But the reality is, it's just molten galena. Yeah. So fascinating. I don't. I don't. Yeah, I, I think this this is a real nice hobby to have. Oh, and and there's so many universities, museums are using portal wax. I reckon it's it's there's there's very few that are not. Yeah, yeah it's it's uh, it's 
I've got a friend of mine who was testing Easter Island statues at um, oh, wow. it was a, it was a British museum with University College London. Yeah, there's so it's so exciting, and I'm glad you put this in because it you know you've you've talked about the the um, Iberian pyrite belt as you know an empire builders, and then we can really track it through time. It's yeah, yeah. I love it. It's it's fascinating. Yeah, no, really fascinating. fascinating. Yeah. So I think I think um, yeah, that's done. So this is, uh, this is this is the last slide here, Todd. Georgia. Yeah, this is columnar jointing on a on a, a high level intrusive. High level intrusive. So I, I just love this love this picture. Yeah. No, it's beautiful, really beautiful. And um, I know you're flat out, Jim. So I really appreciate this. And and uh, yeah, you, you you're also I think you're going to be speaking at a um, a conference, the Chile Geochemistry Conference soon, right? That, that's right. That's in in, in September and. Um, I guess there'll be slight differences. I won't give such a, it won't be specific, so specific about the Romana, but I'll try and provide um, sort of case studies on uh, how I've used the Vanta in difficult terrains, in, in arid terrains, in, in remote terrains, in, in areas where we don't have a lot of budget and just look for solutions for uh, regional studies really. Um, and, and, and just how good the Vanta is at producing baseline data which is fit for purpose which 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 uh, obviously will be uh, you know generic portable xrf you know the benefits of portable xrf across in a lot of more detail in those projects that you mentioned at the start that's yeah. right yeah that's that's, that's, that's right yeah. i'm looking forward to that that'll be yeah. that'll be great that'll okay be great. oh well thanks again mate i really really appreciate it and uh um happy drilling wish you success right. no worries we'll be in touch yep take care mate